It's opening weekend at Keeneland. Let's cap the card. Salutations and welcome, friends. My name is Matthew DeSantis. You can find me on Twitter at the handle at Failed to Menace. And this is one of our new shows that we're going to be doing on a weekly basis called Capping the Card, where myself and sometimes a special guest, just me today, uh, but sometimes myself and a special guest will go through and cap an entire card, usually one of the bigger cards of the coming weekend. And it's not meant to be an exhaustive discussion. I'm not trying to keep you here for an hour and a half while I talk about the race shape of every single race and all, you know, 15 horses that are being entered in some of these cases, but rather to give you a couple of pieces of information. One is the most likely winner. The other is the best value or, or in some cases, the best long shot to consider using either up top, maybe if you really like that horse or underneath in exotics. If you're playing pick sequences, make sure to include some of those best value horses in those. But the point is to go through all 11 races on the Saturday card at Keeneland. A lot of graded stakes races on the card. There's a pick five graded stakes uh, in kind of the middle if you want to play that. Uh, there's a lot of really great sequences here. So should be a lot of fun. Like I said, we're going to run through all 11 races from 1 to 11. I'm going to give you my most likely winner and best value play and kind of talk a little bit about the race shape as it goes in, but really spend two to three minutes on each race. So make sure to like and subscribe to Trust the Profits to get all of our content that we're turning out. And like I said, make sure to follow me on Twitter at the handle at Failed to Menace. Well, like I said, it is a jam-packed card on Saturday at Keeneland. We're all excited for the fall to arrive, and that means Keeneland is here. And so let's kick things off and let's go straight to the first race. And this is a $50,000 maiden claimer, seven furlongs on the dirt for three-year-olds and up. And this is a race where we're going to kick things off. I kind of like chalk as the most likely winner. The number four bourbon on fire just makes a lot of sense. Uh, this is a horse that's taking a massive class drop, has been running in $100,000 plus maiden special weights. Uh, and I, I think this just is going to suit him very well in this particular spot. Uh, the other thing to point out, this horse's best performance to date has been at seven furlongs. Uh, so this is a horse that had very high expectations, a high sales price, $225,000 in the sales, has not delivered on those expectations yet. But like I said, it's been running against very high caliber competition. This feels like a class drop to get this horse on the win in a big, uh, you know, during a big meet and, and then move on from there. Uh, but I think bourbon on fire at five to two makes a lot of sense. Now, one of the things you'll see in the graphics at the bottom is I also mentioned stable duel. Anybody who follows me knows that I play stable duel. It's a fantasy horse racing game. There's a ton of contests for stable duel at Keeneland this weekend. There's some low dollar games where you can enter a $5 contest. You could also enter a $50 contest. Uh, there's pro you know really big prize pots. If you've never played Stable Duel, it's a lot of fun. You essentially are given a salary cap, and you have to select 10 horses underneath that salary cap. And the salary cap is determined, or the cost of the horses is determined by their morning line price. So it doesn't fluctuate, so it's set at a morning line. If any of you have played uh, Daily Fantasy, very, very similar setup. Uh, but on Stable Duel, Bourbon on Fire would cost you $8,500. Uh, and so, like I said, I have those Stable Duel factoids there at the bottom in case you're playing along, wanting to build a stable. Definitely encourage you to check it out. Uh, really a lot of fun to play. A lot of us on Trust the Profits play Stable Duel. I know Colin does. Vinny does sometimes. I do all the time. So should be a lot of fun uh, this weekend at Keeneland. Now, that said, the best value play, I think, in race one, I'm looking to the inside, which I usually don't like to do in sprints, but I, I do like the one celluloid hero here, uh, for McLean Robertson uh, with Francesco Arietta aboard. This is a horse that drops in class as well from Maine's special weights, but is coming from Delaware Park to Keeneland. Now, 
as actually running for a bigger purse uh, in a maiden claimer at Keeneland than he was running for at uh, maiden special weights at Delaware Park. But nonetheless, you're you're facing a slightly different type of competition uh, and is coming over. This is a horse I really liked what he did last time, stretched out and really showed a lot of speed last time. Now, he ended up fading, but that was a mile and 70 yards. So we're shortening up a furlong. I like that. We're getting Lasix for the first time. I like that on Celluloid Hero. 10 to 1. I think you can find some value here on a horse that I, I think is definitely progressed from race 1 to race 2. Now you're getting Lasix and going from race 2 to race 3. Definitely like that in Celluloid Hero. So 10 to 1, I feel like he's a really good value on the board uh, coming in from Delaware Park. Well, let's move to race 2, which is another maiden race, but this is a pretty expensive $100,000 maiden special weight for six furlongs on the dirt for two-year-old fillies. And here I'm going to go with the number five horse, Stay Fabulous. Morning line is at nine to two. Uh, this is a Steve Asmussen horse jockeyed by Ricardo Santana Jr. Now, if you look at those jockey trainer combinations in the racing form, you're going to see a big old goose egg because when these two teamed up last year, this was during Asmussen and Santana Jr.'s epic cold streak uh, that they were on. Asmussen at one point had lost 70 plus consecutive races in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And uh, that just, uh, you know, was, was pretty amazing considering how accomplished Steve Asmussen was. Obviously, there was this kind of very bitter divorce between Asmussen and Santana Jr., all stemming from the ride that Santana Jr. gave to Silver State back last year at Pennsylvania Derby Day. Uh, but those two seem to have mended fences. You're seeing Ricardo Santana Jr. back on, certainly most famously Echo Zulu, uh, but back on some of other Asmussen's rides. The scores at 9-2 to two still gives you really good value. This is a very large field, so there's no kind of 6-5 to five favorite here. But uh, at 9-2, to two, I like this from a pedigree standpoint. I also like this. this is a first time starter, I should say, in Stay Fabulous. Violence is the sire of Stay Fabulous. Violence is producing 19% first time out two year old winners. He's one of the best sires at first time out two year old winners that's out there. He really produces at a very high rate. His his progeny tend to be very precocious early on. Um, a couple of nice five furlong works. If you go back, look at the work tab. Uh, but that typical last workout for Asmussen, a nice kind of slow three furlong workout. Uh, very typical. This is a my race horse horse. It also feels like this is a very purposeful placement opening weekend at Keeneland. Uh, they want to try to get this horse a win. Like I said, most likely winners stay fabulous. In terms of a value, though, Take a look at Good Connections. This is a horse that is coming second back from the layoff, is actually going back to his preferred distance. First time back off from the layoff went a mile. I think cutting back to six furlongs is where this horse is going to perform best. Um, there's also a lot of first-time runners in this particular field. I actually like picking a horse that has some experience uh, and has, you know, gone through the motions a few times, just the familiarity of loading into the gate, the professionalism of going through the paddock, et cetera. A magical loot at eight to one. Ian Wilkes, again, a, a trainer I really like in Kentucky, Brian Hernandez Jr. on board. Again, I feel like those are pretty good connections. I uh, like the experience. The number four, Inventing Anna, <coughs> excuse me, Inventing Anna at six to one, also a possibility to look at in race two. Well, let's head to race three, and this is one of my type of races. $30,000 claimer uh, for uh, seven furlongs on the dirt for three-year-olds and up uh, at Phillies and Mares. And, you know, this is, I'm not blown away by anyone in this particular race. If I was playing this in a sequence, I would definitely encourage you to spread. Uh, what I would say is the number seven big Java is the most likely winner in this spot, three to one on the morning line. <clears throat> Why do I think that? This horse is getting a bit of class relief. I actually ran a listed stakes race last time out uh, and has run against some better company. Now that said, has been getting blown out by that company. So, you know, again, take that for what you will, but the, the class drop should definitely help the, the seven here. Uh, hopefully get back in the win column. I also feel like the cutback to a one turn race should help. This horse has been running a mile in the 16th. I think cutting back to uh, seven furlongs is probably for the best for Big Java. 
I do like Mrs. Nucci quite a bit, and, and I, I was kind of torn between which one of these was the most likely winner. Uh, I think Mrs. Nucci is a, is a nice horse. Interesting running lines. Took forever to break her maiden. Then immediately went to the turf after that, turned in a clunker, came back and ran decent at a $30,000 claimer. This feels like a horse that just needs to get acclimated to its surroundings a little bit. Sometimes when a horse you know, enters and starts going up against other winners for the first time, you know, yeah, great horses are going to breeze through that company. Horses like Mrs. Nucci, it might take a race or two for them to get acclimated to this new class that they are running against. And so I like the fact that this horse ran a decent race at 30,000 on the dirt last time out. Uh, and so uh, definitely something to look at. The number four, Sweet Beauty, is another horse at a little bit of a bigger price. I think it's a strong possibility, too. That horse, there's not a ton of speed in this race. That horse might actually be pretty just right off the pace. And, and so the pace setup might work for Sweet Beauty, who just broke her maiden last time out. So let's cruise along to race four, which is a $100,000 optional claimer, six furlongs on the dirt for the two-year-olds. Uh, you don't see, you know, you don't see many hundred thousand dollar optional claim is for two-year-olds yet but that's what makes keeneland so special the most likely winner is probably the number four uh tap in uh tap in formation uh which is a very cute uh name uh that you know you could just kind of run all together tap in formation and this horse ran huge on debut ran a buyer speed figure that was 10 points or more better than everybody else in the field um could experience some regression and likely still win based off of those figures. Now, the one thing is this horse was getting tired at the end of that maiden race at the same distance at six furlongs. So this horse is hardly invincible. What I will say, um, Wayne Catalano is a trainer. I like in dirt sprints. A lot of times I think Flo uh, Giroux is probably a good jockey to have on this particular horse, uh, in this, in this place. Cause he's going to get her out to the lead. Um, at, at four to five, though, she's I'm not going to use her in a lot of bets. Uh, I think she's the most likely winner, but I'm not going to be, you know, singling her by any stretch uh, in this uh, particular race. And if you're playing on stable duel, I'm definitely not going to use this horse. Eleven thousand dollars for any horse and any optional claimer is just way too much for my liking, because uh, that takes up over 20 percent of your stable duel budget if you're playing the contest. Uh, and honestly, the only horse that's worth that is flight line. Uh, so, and, and tap information is not flight line. Uh, so who would I go to from a betting value standpoint? Well, this is where I look at the six good luck 10 to one in the morning line. Really like the fact that this horse could really capitalize because here's the thing. The four is the clear speed, but the three, uh, to her inside is, uh, or to his inside, I should say is getting the blinkers on. I have a feeling the three and four could really duke it out and maybe wear each other out, particularly for two-year-olds. If this was a three-year-old and up race, speed of the speed typically wins. I don't worry about tiring too much at six furlongs, but for two-year-olds, yeah, I do. Uh, and so this is a horse, the number six, good luck. They could really sit right behind that early speed of tap information and the number three horse and really be able to maybe boomerang around uh when it comes and slingshot around i should say when it comes time uh to make a move this horse ran on turf first time out then moved immediately to dirt got a win right away now granted it was at a maiden claimer but still i like the fact they made the move to dirt one immediately i like edgar morales as a jockey quite a bit the trainer uh gerano garcia is a very proven trainer on the claiming circuit 17 percent uh win rate uh, off the claim. So uh, I, I like this horse quite a bit. This was a horse that was in the Brendan Walsh barn. So it had some class, had some class, I think. And uh, at 10 to one, definitely like the value there for good luck. So let's move along to race five. We're almost to the graded stakes portion of the card, but race five, we have a $110,000 allowance, seven furlongs on the dirt for three-year-olds and up. And this race is, you know, an interesting one in that the four Gulfstream way, who I think is the most likely winner at four to one on the morning line, is just incredibly consistent. Eight to eight out of 10 times in the money uh, in his career really doesn't run a bad race. Speed figures are consistent. They're solid. He's proven at this level. 
there's a lot of reasons to think this is absolutely the most likely winner in this race. Um, will be forward, but does not need to lead. I always like horses that can be versatile in that regard. So it, this race should set up nicely for the four. That said, if you're looking for some value, I do think St. Andrews at the number nine horse at 15 to one really provides some very, very nice prices uh, there. This is a horse that has great connections. Mike Maker is a trainer who just came out of a great meet at Kentucky Downs. And now it's just going straight right up the road to Keeneland. And then, of course, Jose Ortiz. So I like those connections. The running line for St. Andrews is very muddied. Uh, there's some turf, there's some dirt, there's some routing, there's some sprinting. It's kind of, you got to really dissect it. I do think dirt and seven furlongs actually should be perfect for this horse. Has run against some nice competition, has run against horses like uh, Surfer Dude and, and some others. So has run against uh, Best Actor, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So has run against some good horses. And, and so I like that this number nine could add some value, St. Andrews. Uh, and I'm also a golf fan. So, you know, St. Andrews, you got to like that for the British Open. Um, but yeah, definitely like this horse underneath. And if you're playing on Stable Duel, again, 15 to one, only going to cost you $500. That's only 1% of your overall budget. So spending such so little on this horse could allow you to spend up on some other horses, maybe later on in the card or some favorites that you really like. So let's start moving into the graded stakes portion of the card and they kick things off with the grade two Woodward stakes. That's five and a half furlongs on turf for three-year-olds and up. And this features the horse everybody loves to fade, which is Golden Pal, uh, who, whether you like it or not, is the most likely winner in this race, I think. Uh, and so, you know, four to five on the morning line, Wesley Ward, Irad Ortiz Jr., that said, Golden Pal has looked invincible, ran very poorly over at Royal Ascot, then came back, looked very pedestrian and barely eking out a victory at uh, Saratoga, but is now coming back, is returning to that Keeneland turf that this horse absolutely loves, uh, has trained beautifully on this turf. Those five furlong bullet works look great. The five furlong breeze work looked amazing as well. Actually, almost better than the bullet work. So this horse looks like he's back in prime condition. Again, feels like the most likely winner in this particular race. But there is an interesting factor here, which is Artemis City Limits. Artemis City Limits has a ton of speed as well. Now, one of the things Golden Pal did show last time out at Saratoga was he could come from off the pace. Uh, which is not something he typically does. And so he, he, came, he sat third for a portion of that race before making a move and finally grinding out a victory. If Artemis City Limits wants to go, then maybe Irad has some choices. doesn't have to be forced into a speed duel, um, but it is still something to be concerned about where he's going to break and that sort of thing. Uh, but Artemis City Limits, I feel like, is going to control a lot of things in this particular race. He faded late last time out at Kentucky Downs. It's not all that uh, surprising. Uh, and I, when I say faded, he didn't fade that much. Brand simply caught him. I think Brand's just a better horse. Uh, but uh, Artemis City Limits is a very good horse that could end up throwing a little bit of a monkey wrench in here. That said, this is why I like the value play of the number nine Katamosto so much. Because Katamosto should sit right behind Golden Pal and Artemis City Limits. He's got the outside post. He's going to be able to drop in where he wants to, but should be in a nice stalking position for this race. This used to be a Joseph O'Brien trained horse, ran a ton overseas, came over, ran a second in a stakes race the first time in North America, now is coming back. I always like horses second time in North America. They tend to take one or two races to get acclimated to the new conditions. Love Flavion Pratt aboard. And again, from a stable duel standpoint, great value. So uh, definitely, if you don't want to play Golden Pal, I, I get it. If you want to spread a little bit more, Artemis City Limits, Katamosto. Uh, there are some other races and places you could go in this race, I think. But I do think Golden Pal is still the most likely winner, but maybe using Katamosto in stable duel. So let's move to race seven, which is the Thoroughbred Club of America stakes, and uh, which is six furlongs on the dirt for three-year-olds and up uh, who are fillies and mares. And this is one where, I, you know, maybe I'm being snooty, and that happens sometimes when it comes to horse racing. Um, I'm just not sold on the favorite in this race, which is the horse Slammed, 
uh, the number seven horse. Horse has been, you know, didn't get a lot of respect because it's been running in the Southwest at Zia Park and places like that. Then goes to Del Mar and wins a stakes race, uh, or maybe an optional claimer, I should say. And then comes and runs second to Edgeway, which is who's an excellent horse. Uh, and so two really big efforts. But here's the thing. I generally do not like West Coast turf horses shipping to the Midwest. It's just, uh, it's just, I don't love that move a lot of times. Um, and I, so slammed as a horse, I'm just kind of fading in this spot. I think that she's definitely shown, she's shown up and, and, you know, maybe she'll prove me wrong, but I, I'm going to fade slammed. And so I actually ended up going with a long shot as my most likely winner, the number eight joyful cadence. Uh, this is a horse that I think is the best early speed from a pace standpoint. Uh, if you look at those time form us pace indicators has the best speed love the connections of john ortiz and ray luke gutierrez uh, I, I just feel like this is a horse that runs very consistent has been improving and, and provides really great value in what i feel is a very wide open race uh this is a very contested field now if you want to play a safer pick what i would say is if you do want to go with slammed what i would say is use a horse like club car underneath uh club car is just an incredibly consistent horse ran 28 times, finished second 13 times, uh, finished in the money 23 times out of 28. It's not a horse that wins much, but man alive, this horse competes and runs honest and is always in the money. Nine to two in the morning line, uh, that's nice value to use in underneath in deeper vertical exotics. So, so uh, you're also getting a jockey upgrade with Irad Ortiz Jr. hopping aboard. So maybe you think Club Car can actually break through this time. This horse always turns in a great effort. Would not be surprised if it ends up in the winner's circle. And again, nine to two, you're still getting, I think, good value. Well, let's head to the eighth race, which is the grade one first lady stakes. This is a mile on turf for the three-year-olds and up fillies and mares. And this might as well be called the Chad Brown stakes uh, because Chad Brown has uh, several runners in this very small field. Uh, but I think the most likely winner will be his, uh, I think, best horse in a mile uh, on turf, which is Regal Glory. Uh, I just really love this horse. Uh, I think she gets back to her winning ways. Seven for 13 in her career, winning at this distance. Three for four winning this year. The works have looked fantastic. You know, got beat by Casa Creed last time out at the four-star Dave. but. I, I don't know. I can chalk that one up to a, a few different things. Uh, Chad Brown, Jose Ortiz, just really like this horse uh, in this particular spot. I also think the horse in Italian, who's one of the other Chad Brown horses in this field, technical analysis, another. I, I don't know if in Italian is going to get the sort of dream trip that she got the last time out. So I'm kind of fading in Italian a little bit there. Also, the thing is, you're not getting really any value on any of these Chad Brown horses. So from a best value standpoint, I would actually move outside of the Chad Brown bar. I'd look at the Michael Stidham horse, Princess Grace, a horse that I just always have really loved. Uh, she's just so versatile. She runs on so many different surfaces, uh, always turns in a very honest effort. Uh, and and I, I just think is a really solid horse. Has some versatility to either sit right off the pace, be on the pace. Can she can sit mid pack as well? This is a smaller field, so I'd expect her to be forwardly placed. Here's the reason I really love her is that she's never finished out of the money at this distance. Uh, so even if you don't love Princess Grace up top, I feel like you're foolish not to include her in vertical exotics. If you just want to do a five to exact to straight up, uh, I, you know, that's something that's at least going to be profitable for you. Uh, one of the things I always say is when you find a race and you really can't get around chalk, and even if you don't like Regal Glory, technical analysis is five to two. In Italian is three to one. I mean, you're not going to get a huge price out of any of these Chad Brown horses. There's other ways you can try to manufacture value from chalk. One of them is obviously singling in a pick sequence. The other is just using vertically and attacking longer shots and bigger values underneath and using exotics. This is why I love the horse Happy Saver. Happy Saver makes me money on races where I shouldn't make any money. He runs second to life is good. He runs second to flight line. He just runs underneath all the time. He runs second to a, you know, uh, yeah. So he just, you know, he runs underneath. I just love a horse like that. And he runs underneath at a big price. And so always makes those exotics a little bit more expensive. So let's go from three-year-old fillies and up to 
bunch of two-year-olds in the grade one breeders futurity. And this is one that I'm sure everybody's going to be really excited about uh, race nine on the card mile and a 16th on dirt for two-year-olds. Where am I going in this race? This is the huge field. And I think you could go in a lot of different directions. Uh, I'm a little skeptical of the favorite just because the favorite is coming off of a race uh, in which uh, ran on a sealed track. And uh, It goes back to this debate we had right before the Belmont about the horse, we the people, how good is a horse on a sealed track? And so that's one of the reasons why the horse Forte is who's the favorite is kind of fading a little bit. You saw a massive bump in the speed figures on that sealed track up at uh, Saratoga. And uh, I'm just not so sure you're going to see he'll be able to replicate that effort. Therefore, who am I going to? I'm going to my favorite big day combination of Brad Cox and Florent Giroux. I'm going to Loggins, going to the danger zone. Uh, Kenny Loggins reference. Uh, Four to one on the morning line. This horse has been training lights out. This horse ran a huge speed figure the first time out, ran a 90 speed figure when breaking its maiden. uh, Is a a son of Ghost Zapper, sold for $460,000 at the sales. Uh, like I said, Florent Giroux, Brad Cox on big days, particularly in Kentucky. It's just a barn I tend to trust a lot. I think he has this horse primed up. I think he can get these two-year-olds going. So really like Loggins is the most likely winner in this spot. Like I said, very wide open race. Uh, and it could go in a lot of different directions. Young horses, you never know how they respond to these big moments. But I like Loggins because he's got speed. And sometimes you have to make your own luck. And breaking well and getting good placement is a big part of that. Now, from a value standpoint, there's a lot of value you can go after in this race. I like the number 10 lost arc quite a bit. Love the connections, Todd Pletcher, Flavion Pratt. Uh, Then this is a horse that improved from first start to second start in terms of buyer speed figures. This horse wanted a mile. I like that. Now that we're only stretching out another half furlong, a lot of these horses have only run seven furlongs, six furlongs. Here's lost arc has run a, a mile. Nobody's better at getting horses ready for distance than Todd Pletcher. Also, second start was a stakes race, which he won by seven lengths. And you say, who did he beat? Well, here's one of the horses he beat, Major Dude. Why does that name sound familiar? Well, Major Dude just won a Breeders' Cup win in your in race on the turf, admittedly, last weekend at Belmont at Aqueduct, uh, or whatever they're calling it these days, the BAQ, I guess. And so... You know, beat a pretty legitimate field by a huge margin last time out. So I do like Lost Ark. I, I think that's a good value play at six to one. Again, playing on stable duel five thousand uh, dollars. That's your average horse cost. Again, you have to build a stable of ten horses with a fantasy total of fifty thousand dollars. Each horse is going to cost you a certain amount of money based upon the morning line. Five thousand dollars is the average cost that you can use per horse. So Lost Ark fits right into that. Really like uh, that horse quite a bit in the ninth race, but I, I like Loggins. I do. I think this horse is going to run big. I just have a feeling. And, and Brad Cox and Shug McGahey are two trainers where a lot of times I go based off a gut, um, where you just look at a horse sometimes and you go, I think they think something. Uh, and, you know, Shug with Pleasant Passage uh, last weekend in the Miss Grio, that was one where I, I was on that. And that was another kind of gut feel of, this feels like a Suge McGahee horse that's going to run big. This feels like a Brad Cox horse that's going to run big in this particular race. Well, let's go to uh, what I think is the the kind of star race of the day, the turf mile, grade one, mile on the turf for three-year-olds and up. And this is just an absolutely loaded field. Uh, I have to say, personally, I love Santon. Santon is one of my favorite horses out maybe simplification is one of my other favorites, but Santin is a horse I absolutely love. And this horse has made me money at Churchill Downs. This horse made me money last year, running second to beyond brilliant out of the Hollywood Derby, uh, 17 to one. This horse has turned into a really, really, really great turf horse. But here's the thing about Santin. As much as I love him, his two biggest grade one victories have come on the Churchill Downs turf. And here's a question for you. Do we call the surface at Churchill turf? Is is that green stuff actually turf or is it just spray painted green? I mean, that that Churchill Downs turf is funky. And there is a reason that they're not running on it. And they're trying to let the roots get in more. And, and it's just been a disaster trying to get this new turf course up and running for Churchill. 
Some horses have responded really well to it. Santon clearly likes it a lot, but I'd like to see him win a race outside of that. You know, when he went down to the fairgrounds, he didn't win out there. I mentioned uh, Del Mar. You know, he finished second out there. Now, here's the thing. He won on the Keeneland turf before. So, you know, now granted, it was an allowance race. It was earlier in his uh, career, but still has won there before. So I, I do like that from him. The problem I have with Santon in this race is there's going to be a lot of front end speed. I think you're going to see classic Causeway. You're going to see smooth, like straight. You're going to see Santon. You might see a couple of others up there on the lead. I feel like it's going to be contested up front. Therefore, my most likely winner, I'm going to go with the number six, Ivar. Ivar is a horse that I think is going to come running late. I think the pace sets up perfectly here. Paolo Lobo on a big day. Uh, I, I This is a horse that does not often stack up back-to-back -back races without a layoff. So I actually think this will be beneficial. This horse ran really nicely in a second place to Modern Games, who I think is a monster last time out at Woodbine. The number six, Ivar, six to one, really like this. The best value in this race, love uh, Mason, the Chad Brown horse with Flavian Pratt aboard. Anytime you can get a Chad Brown horse jockey by Flavian at 12 to one on the morning line, this horse is only going to cost you $750 on stable duel. You got to take it. This is a horse that has been in the money in all those races this year, five for five in the money at a mile distance, should sit just off the pace, be very well positioned. This is a horse that I've been underwhelmed by, but at 12 to 1, I'm not going to pass up. When this horse gets bet down, I don't like it as much. But from a morning line standpoint, from a stable duel standpoint, absolutely great value on a horse that always turns in really strong efforts. Even if they don't get in the winner's circle, 12 to 1, you're still going to do really well in the stable duel contest, accumulating points uh, for second, third, fourth, or even fifth. So like I said, a lot of ways to win on stable duel. You don't just have to pick winners. You can pick horses underneath. And Mason feels like a good underneath value play to include in some exotics and if you're spreading uh, in a pick sequence. Well, let's go to the last race of the day which is $100,000 maiden special weight, seven furlongs on the dirt for three-year-olds and up. Where am I going here? Well, listen, if you're going to call a horse, call me fast. The horse better be fast. And I actually like this horse quite a bit. The number eight horse, call me fast by Michael Puich, uh, Francesco area at, at a board, six to one in the morning line. Here's why I like this horse. It has improved in every single start. The buyer speed figures get better every single time out. The placement in the races gets better every single time out. I like everything about this horse. The workouts look really strong. Should be close to the lead. I love the odds at six to one. So call me fast. That I think is your most likely winner. The favorite in this race is the 10 horse. Here's the thing about the 10 Trafalgar. This is a horse that's coming off a five month layoff is a Safi Joseph junior horse running in Kentucky. That usually sets off alarm bells for people. Safi in Florida, I always trust. Safi outside of Florida, eh, it depends. Jersey, I, I trust him a little bit in the Mid-Atlantic. Kentucky, I don't trust him as much. Um, and so Trafalgar just feels like a horse, a favorite I want to fade. So call me fast. That's where I'm going to go for my most likely winner. And then best value, uh, actually a horse that's a little bit less on the morning line, uh, Neshoba's Joy, 5-1. Uh, to one. I like this horse quite a bit. This horse was on turf first time out and closed like a freaking freight train, closed about 10 lengths and three furlongs uh, and really just made a hell of a move late, but got off to a terrible start. Well, here's the thing. Neshoba's Joy gets the blinkers added. I always love that move on Maidens uh, and should be closer to the pace. The trainer, William Morey, has good success going turf to dirt, uh, also has been gelded since the last time out. So I think Neshoba's Joy at 5-1 to one presents really nice value as a horse that showed a ton of talent last time. If is able to get off to a better start, really like where you're going here. So that is all 11 races for Saturday at Keeneland. And we did it in about 30 minutes, which is pretty damn good. So uh, I hope this was enjoyable. I hope you you know, are able to use this to pick some winners, even if you sit there and think, well, Matthew, I don't know if this horse is going to win. Maybe you include some of the long shots in a pick sequence. A few of them hit that sort of thing. Hopefully it makes you a little bit of money, but listen, best of luck Saturday at Keeneland should be a great day of racing. Uh, and make sure to like, and subscribe to the trust the profits YouTube page, and make sure to follow me on Twitter for all of my horse racing content at the handle at failed to menace until next time, friends, remember that it's now, Post time.